Today I'm going to prove once and for all that I actually do use my lathe to make this cute little ring box. Hit it! I've gotten a lot of crap over the years for wearing my platinum wedding band in just about every video around spinning tools, so I figured it was finally time to do something about it, and now I'm wearing a Kalo silicone ring. Uh, it's very lightweight, feels good on the finger, and I could be comfortable that if something snags on that, this thing is just going to break instead of taking my finger with it. But that means I need a safe place to store my ring, and that was the inspiration for this project. So the lid just pops off like this. It's a very simple design. The base has the tenon, and essentially the top is the mortise. And you can see you could fit quite a few rings or small pieces of jewelry in there. Now, because I don't turn all that often, sometimes I need a refresher. So I just want to send a quick shout out to Mike Walt, gentleman on YouTube who has a great video on how to make a lidded box. And I kind of use that to get my brain back in the game of turning so I knew exactly what I was doing when I approached the project. Now, that said, I still had a couple of stages to get to this point. Let me show you the uh, predecessors to this one. So here's attempt number one. Uh, kind of basic in shape, right? This domed top, it's, I don't know, kind of ugly. Looks like a pantyhose container. Why do I know that? Well, look, what I do on the weekend is my business, not yours. Um, and you can see I just was perfecting the concept of the mortise and tenon, just to make sure I could get it to work. And that was a success, but clearly this was not a very elegant design. I didn't like it, uh, but you know, it's serviceable, got the job done. Now version two, I got a little bit more into making uh, some kind of design on the top that I thought looked good, but this one's way off balance, right? If you look at the size of the lid and the size of the base, they're too close. All right, so this one's clunky. There's a lot of extra solid wood in here that doesn't need to be there. Much larger than it needs to be, but I liked where it was going. Version three kind of didn't get off the ground because I got a little bit of a, a snag having to do with a dropped GoPro camera. Uh, you know, it happens. It's the uh, things we go through for good video. Uh, and then finally, version four, which should have been version three, but version four is a little bit more proportioned nicely, right? And I uh, got the mortise and tenon here perfected for a really nice fit. Uh, a nice indent uh, on the bottom here that gives it a good balance and overall happy with the product. So let me show you how I made it. I used 12 quarter stock for this, but you can use anything that gets you the size box you want. I mark the center point on both ends and mount the blank on the lathe. I start bringing the blank into round using a square carbide turning tool. Alternatively, you could use either a bowl gouge or a roughing gouge for this step. Once all of the flat areas are gone, I add a small dovetail shoulder to each end. The shoulders are cut on a slight angle to match the angle of the dovetail jaws on my chuck, which we'll use in a minute. To separate the lid from the base, I'll use a parting tool. Once I'm left with a little nub connecting the two pieces, I use a saw to do the final separation. The smaller piece is the lid, and we'll start working on that one first. I'll pop out the chuck spur and thread on the chuck. So now we can work on the inside of the lid. This is essentially a mortise of sorts, so I'll start by hollowing out the center to my liking, staying at least a quarter inch away from the outside edge. The round cutter I'm using makes it very easy to make a nice, graceful curve. Once I'm happy with the depth, I switch back to the square cutter to refine the mortise. The edge should be nice and straight for at least a quarter inch in depth. From there, the surface can just blend into the curve. So I'll use the round cutter again to do the final blending. The thickness of the outer wall here isn't critical. I shoot for about a quarter inch knowing that I still have some stock to remove from the outside surface. With the square tool, I'll true up the outside lip of the lid. If you don't do this, the two halves of the box may not come together perfectly. The interior is then sanded thoroughly to about 500 grit. If you want, you can actually apply finish to the inside of the lid right on the lathe. So now let's work on the base. The first step is to create the tenon. We'll use the lid to check our progress as we go. Keep in mind that if you go too far and the fit is loose, you can always remove the tenon and start over, assuming you have enough stock in the blank. Eventually I end up with a nice snug fit and a tenon that's about a quarter inch long. The next step involves turning the outside of the lid, so we need to attach it to the base. If the fit is loose, the lid will just fly off, so I use a piece of paper towel to help snug it up. Now I can turn the outside surface and true it up. And if you want to have some fun with the shape, go for it. I'm just going for a boring straight side. 
The lid has way more stock than I need, so I'm making a couple of reference lines. One for the start of a decorative raised area and one for the shoulder that leads to that raised area. Everything above the top line is waste. For the decorative top, I create a 3 8 of an inch shoulder, leaving a quarter inch high raised area. I could then begin to gently round over that raised section into a shape that looks good to my eye. From there I can easily round over the edges. And now it's time for some more sanding. In fact, let's sand the sides while we're at it. Now if the lid was too tight, some folks may have trouble removing it. Not that it ever happens to me. Mine usually slip right off, but if that should happen to you, uh, though it didn't happen for me, you could put the blank in the oven at the lowest setting for about 15 to 20 minutes and that should shrink the wood just enough to allow you to pop it right off. With the lid off, we can start to work on the inside of the base. This is just like the work we did on a lid. Go as deep as you like and keep the tenon wall at least 3 16 of an inch thick. You could go thinner, but that starts to get a little bit fragile. Use an elaborate depth gauge to transfer the depth to the outside, and then draw a line about a half of an inch down from there. That's the bottom of the box, and we'll part the blank right on that line. The remaining nub in the chuck will now serve as a jam chuck for the final stage of turning. This is pretty easy to do by simply cutting a slight tapered tenon into the end of the blank nub. After a few test fits, we should have a pretty snug connection. The bottom of the base receives a slight hollow in the middle and a nice perimeter ring that ensures that the base won't wobble. As I started working, I noticed that the base didn't really feel secure enough, so I used the paper towel trick again to snug things up. And the final shaping involves rounding over the bottom corner, and then it's another round of sanding. Next up, the finish, but first... Now I just want to take a break in the action here to talk a little bit about the tools that I'm using because I know this is going to come up. Uh, these are easy wood tools and they're based on that sort of carbide insert system, right? So when you get a dull edge, you just kind of loosen it, turn it, tighten it back up and you're back to work. Uh, and you can get them in all kinds of shapes and they're very versatile and very beginner friendly because ultimately these things are just scrapers. And kind of like a scraper versus a plane in the shop, with a plane you have a tendency to tear out a little bit more and you have to know how to use the tool and have it really well tuned so that it doesn't tear out and you got to know your materials. Well, kind of the same thing in wood turning. Traditional tools have to be very sharp, takes a little bit more in the way of a learning curve, and if you mess up, you can mess up big if something goes wrong, but it's experience that prevents that from happening. These, on the other hand, are very beginner friendly. It makes the craft of wood turning much more approachable to folks who are just getting into it because everybody fears that big kickback, right? Uh, and these scrapers help prevent that from happening or make it a little bit less likely to happen. So I'm a big proponent of these. I think uh, anything that gets people into the craft and lowers the learning curve is a good thing because ultimately someone may use these tools for years and say, you know what, I want to take it to the next level. I really want a glass smooth finish right off of the tool without having to do a whole lot of sanding. So they may go and pick up a skew chisel for the first time and look up how to use it and suddenly they fall in love with this thing, right? So I don't understand the folks who, who want to, you know, criticize these tools and say it's not real wood turning if you're using these because ultimately this entry level stuff may be the thing that gets someone deeper into the craft. And for someone like me who doesn't turn that often, this is kind of all I need. And, uh, you know, I, I have these tools, I know how to use them, um, but Darn, it's difficult for me to pick them up when these are just so easy to use and I don't have to sharpen anything. So that's what I have to say about that. I know some folks will disagree with me, but uh, you're wrong. The finish is nothing more than a satin wiping poly. I soak the box liberally and rub it in with a 500 grit abrasive pad. Then I wipe off the excess and let it dry for a few hours. The second coat goes on in exactly the same way. Once completely dry, add a little wax, uh, paste wax or renaissance wax, whatever, to the mating surfaces of the two pieces. This will ensure that the box is easy to open even when the humidity changes. 
Well, there it is, a nice, simple, lidded box. Now, the cool thing about this design is you can go in any direction you want. You can do all kinds of different things with the top, maybe shape the sides a little bit. I see a lot of cool potential for this. You could also use different species of wood. Imagine a lamination of multiple species, and you've got this sort of almost segmented turning kind of look to it. So a lot of different directions you can go. And also, batch these things out. Uh, these will go fast if you show them to your friends and family, so make a bunch of them because I think people will love to have these, and they're so quick to make. All right, so thanks for watching, everybody, and thanks to Kalo for sponsoring this episode. We'll catch you next time. Thank you.